to be serious, can we really not just just have a conversation on this topic? You seem to be well read in it, and so that's great. So you should have lots of ideas and things to add, and and that's what I would like. I I don't care where you read the idea. I don't want to hear it until later. You know, I like reading recommendations, but I'm a lot more likely to go read something when somebody gives me a compelling argument. Like, you know, I don't just tell people to read some book of Nietzsche's, I'll tell them about Nietzsche's analysis of Descartes' Cogito, and maybe that will make it a compelling reason to, to read the book it's in. It's a lovely, lovely thing, but it can't replace actual conversation and ideas. You read the book, it gives you ideas, that's the point. It's not a place to store ideas so that you don't load them into your own brain and you leave them in the book, no. And I believe you agree with that, so can't we, for example, you said what it is visually dominated science yes i think i made that absolutely clear i agree with that but anton was saying that somehow fundamentally it was visually rooted and that's what i'm arguing with which hopefully with such smart people would bring us to the issue upon which those elements or within which those elements dwell which is okay um can you do science with other senses i'm not sure that Professor Anton thinks you can. I think he said he didn't think you could. So I'd like to know if, you know, you pointed out, but it is dominated by visual. Well, the more important thing to be would be for you to tell me if you agree that it can be based on other examples, you know, referring to use of smell and chemistry and taste and geology and the fact that they're not totally unrepresented. It seems like they can take part in science. So it's a big difference because if you go that it's all visual, then you go the way Anton was going where, and that's why science won't cover everything because it's just this subset of, of information space. Everything that can metaphorically be mapped. Like you can map a lot of stuff into a computer program, but not everything. Or the other argument, which is the one I I'm favor, is that we should balance out the use of all the senses in, in, in science. And the good news is that the scientists already do. They use the other senses in science. Sight and sound are particularly useful in science. But that brings in what is science in the broadest sense. And I argue, and this is something you become familiar with reading cognitive science at this point, is that there it it's ex experientialism okay the empiricism and the material uh, rigidity of physical sciences has focused down on things like mass and length and distance and then fields and stuff right but it's possible to be experientialist to be somewhat empirical about any kind of feeling you can try to be more objective even about something like love and affection and, and what do you really care about more? Even these subjective things. What you need is, like in science, you need a way to repeat the feeling. You need to be able to put yourself in a situation or be able to imagine or somehow me repeat these things. And then you also need some standard that you measure it by. Like a particular experience of that feeling that you remember clearly enough to at least feel like you're comparing. Now, is it gonna be as rigid as mass and distance? Uh, and visual spaces. Visual spaces are very, very consistent. Um, no, not in some respects, but yes in others. And in terms of space, we use a lot of visual metaphor for space, but frankly, the human mind, the human assumption is that all of the senses co-locate. That's the object model, right, of materialism, is that the object is where all the senses can collect whatever information uh, that object generates in their sense domain, which might be minimal, might be below detection, or somehow inappropriate. But in principle, that object exists, and you know, if it has properties, you know, if it's making a sound, you'll hear it, and it's in the same location, you touch it, same location. And we know people can get very accurate spatial um, geometric understandings. Um, if blind so I'd like to talk about things like that you know that that's an important thing to me 
I'm also interested just in, in this uh, Lakoff mathematics thing. I think it, I find it funny. If you talk to mathematicians, mathematicians adopt this mathematical view, this platonic view. And then they're going to say, well, that's the way it is. That's like saying these are the rules of rugby. And somebody is trying to tell you where rugby comes from. And you're like, I disagree with that theory. I think the rugby players, they play rugby. They know where it comes from. I mean, it, it's like they know the rules they've already adopted. The question of how the rules got there and how they all be founded is, is both in the history and it's alive dynamically in the philosophy of mathematics. By which, again, I mean the Bertrand Russell you know, philosophy of mathematics by uh, philosophers that are logicians that actually do set theory and things like that. Now, you know, I have this idea, though you haven't been that specific, that you disagree with this embodied mind approach to mathematics, but you said you disagreed on my view of mathematics when I was talking about is how uh, philosophers of mathematics are the people rebuilding the foundation of mathematics and I certainly hope you're not trying to tell me I'm wrong that after Bertrand Russell the foundations of mathematics had to be has to be rebuilt I are you disagreeing with that's a historical fact as far as I know I don't think that's a controversy personally it's just a matter of how it has to be fixed so uh, I mean, there might be some number of people that say there's something wrong with Russell's paradox, but, but I don't think so. I mean, really? But, so what are you saying? And can't we just talk about those ideas? You're well-read and smart, therefore the ideas have words that can associate with them and they don't have to involve the name of the guy that you think originally had the idea. Please, I won't know until I read that book and have the conversation that you hold back from of your ideas. I won't even know if what you think that guy said is what I think he said, or if I think I know what he thought he said, it's a very dynamic, complex thing. You're trying, it's, it's like trying to hide in this nest of, of complexity relative positions. Don't you understand when you and I talk directly about ideas, you don't have to say, I'm telling you an idea from a book. You just go, well, I read this book. It gave me ideas. I think this is what he was saying, but maybe it's just my idea stimulated from this experience of reading a book. And here's the idea. Right? You know, I only tease you. I don't think I was too mean about the name dropping, but it was there. And then Professor Anton drops the name, and you joke like, oh, there you go. Well, yeah, there he went. I mean, no comment, whatever, on the subject. Why should I believe he understands the subject? I could have had a 10-word a, a sentence on the matter. He could have said, oh, good point about chemistry and smell. Or you could say chemistry and smell is fundamentally different from distance measurement or something that he thought. Did he think anything? Because when you say, oh, you should read this book, I don't think he, I, that's like over there. And, and you know, think about it. Gary goes, you fucking fucked hard, blah, blah, blah. Here's why I think you're an idiot, blah, blah, blah. And the blah, blah, blah parts are like what he thinks. And it gets annoying to cut out the other parts sometimes and listen to it. But at least it's also in there. You know, now there's no, you're a fucktard in that book message. But it's just constantly, well, go read a book, go read that book, go read that book. I went to college. I had good professors. Really good professors. You don't get to send me back to school, Professor Anton. And to be, you're much better about putting some of your ideas in there, but still, you know, you, you this book culture tendency, I guess, to, to go, oh, well, I disagree, and you should read Magal McMockintoff uh, about that. Who cares who disagrees or agrees? I don't get a warm fuzzy when somebody says I agree and I don't get a cold fuzzy when somebody says I disagree I want to know the structure of that agreement or disagreement people say they agree I don't necessarily think they even are sure if they agree they better tell me what they think let me decide if you agree or disagree I want to know the structure I can't get the structure of your ideas from a book written by somebody else it's impossible plus the books are already available I appreciate the recommendations but I been reading pretty much constantly my whole life. I'm going to continue to do it. I don't ex expect I'll finish all the books that I even know about, let alone all the books that probably be good to give a read. But they're out there, right? They're ready for me to read them. But you're an individual. So what is your take, given what you have learned, but not their take that you've learned they have, but your take? 
right? This is proactive skepticism. You assent to what is apparent, which means you investigate and explore what is apparent. A book can help that. But your own, in philosophy, your own subjective experience of the world is, is, is the main source. How you experience the world is the main thing to inform your worldview. That's just the way it has to be. Okay. And what we're really getting into is this issue of, you know, can it be a scientific process? And that's ironic to me if you're not going the lock, the lake off way because the point is even science even I mean even philosophy and everything they can all be done experientially and you can bring science deeper and deeper into the humanities this way through the consistencies of our feelings now some feelings will seem consistent and then because they're very high level they're influenced by sociology and upbringing and stuff you know come one decade for a new generation and boom they're not consistent anymore. But we can separate that out with experientialism, right? Those are still experientially uh, determinable. They can be discovered, discoverable things through experience. It just takes longer. Like when you have an event that only happens, you know, once a hundred years, it takes longer to build up a statistical sample to get a decent theory about what's going on. But it can be done. We're physical systems if you're, you know, if you believe, you know, what I think of as natural philosophy, <coughs> then there's physical reasons for all of these things, which means there's certain kinds of consistency. You know, certain things, if you fix certain variables, things that might seem chaotic suddenly become consistent with respect to that one variable fixed, and you can learn about them. And we can push this all the way up into everything, and, and we don't have to wait until we have scientific fact. We can be experientialist about our subjective experience of what it's like to operate a human mind. And I would like to point out that most of y'all all in every part of the spectrum seem totally clueless about how we operate the human mind because you see to me this is the big mystery and I want the operator's manual. It'd be fun to be the one to write one but geez I just if I could find one everybody often thinks they found some Hindu chakra system up spectral dynamics spiral dynamics whatever operating no you know it, it, none of them quite fit and yet compared to other people I mean I seem to know a tremendous amount I mean you guys people haven't thought about how they live in this 3d holodeck of solid things and that that's built up by a, an organ in the mind obviously from two-dimensional pictures and not even two-dimensional pictures like you'd assume but little circles of color with you know things we don't we know we could see that are happening in the eye we don't experience directly and this solid table we know the feeling of it being solid is from touching it right and that's just that's just a device like a sensor like a mechanical sensor that sends a signal to the brain at a finite speed to the brain by the time it gets to the brain and we start knowing there's something solid there, we know that's a quite noticeable amount of time later. So, are we going to take this into account? Are we going to talk about these things? Uh, I think it has to be done directly. I need to know what your personal experience is. You can't tell me what you read in a book and then we guess what the author's personal experience is without access. This kind of knowledge has to be done conversationally where we back and forth about these perceptive realities as we experience them informed by all of our experiences including the books we've read but not limited to some sort of um, tour through a library or a museum where you can't touch the exhibits okay. so can't we just talk about some of those things can't we just try to have that kind of back and forth because frankly I'm hard up most people don't even realize this issue that we're talking about so it, it's frustrating for me somebody smart aware of the issue that thinks that I disagree with you after lots of discussion with a smart set of smart guys just tell me the disagree the structure of it I, I, I'm bored when people agree I'm not I'm happy you disagree I just want to know the structure of it. The frustration is it not getting any diagramming of the structure, the difference, the alleged differences. <laughs>